Now, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jamie Martinez. Dr. Martinez is the chair of the history department at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, where she has taught um, for 15 years, and she earned her PhD from the University of Virginia. Her 2013 book, Confederate Slave Impressment in the Upper South, explores military uses of enforced labor in Virginia and North Carolina. She regularly speaks on these topics and other aspects of Confederate governance, as well as the home front. Let's welcome Dr. Jamie Martinez. Thank you all so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming as well. So I gave Anne a title, I gave, uh, maybe it was, I gave someone a title a year ago. And then as I was putting the slides together, I thought, let me come up with a more fun title. Uh, so this presentation that I've uh, is, is something I've talked about frequently. Um, the title I have uh, used very often is Raising Corn, Embankments, and a Little Hell. Uh, we are going to be discussing how different groups of North Carolinians were forced to work on behalf of the Confederacy to build fortifications, specifically, most often, the Wilmington fortifications. Um, and we're going to be talking about some of the conflicts that existed over this process. Um, this project began a long time ago. Right? Uh, it started in a graduate school paper. I was writing my second year of graduate school at the University of Virginia. I was researching the slave trade during the Civil War and kept finding these conversations about how the army taking away slaves, the army impressing slaves was affecting the price of slaves, was affecting the rates of hiring for military, for, for manufacturing establishments, but also for farmers who needed extra labor and was also affecting the market, the value of slave purchases. Um, and it hadn't occurred to me that slaves were impressed. Now, I, that should have occurred to me. Who's familiar with the concept of impressment in the Civil War, right? So the army is taking your stuff, basically. That's what it comes down to, right? They're taking things, property that is of military value, right? So it's not surprising that slaves were one of the forms of property they took, but it hadn't occurred to me before. And when I looked in articles and books that talked about it, they all said it didn't work. Slave impressment didn't work because slaveholders refused to participate, right? Um, so all of the scholars who'd written about it said it didn't work, but I had all these sources saying slave impressment is affecting the price of slaves. So it must have worked to some extent. And that's where this project came from. I often share that story with students to sort of say like, you can find a project anywhere, but particularly in these places that that what other historians have said don't line up with the sources you're seeing, right? And then you have a question and a thing you can pursue. Uh, so there's even in a, a, a topic as well discussed as the Civil War, there are always potential new questions in these places where we hadn't thought to look. Um, so that project over time became a book became these talks I give. It's really expanded in recent years uh, from just looking at enslaved people to looking at as well uh, free people of color and especially American Indians. And that's really a function of where I teach. UNC Pembroke was founded by and for American Indians. It's a historically native serving college. About 15% of our student body is American Indian. And so it's something that I have to think about that I didn't until I got there. And a lot of Civil War historians often hadn't thought about until fairly recently. So the little hell that comes in at the end is primarily the Lowry War. The Lumbee, or the origins really of the Lumbee tribe as a political entity and identity is fighting against 
impressment for the Confederate fortifications from the native population of Robeson County, where I work. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so we have just a couple pictures of the defenses. And often when I've given this talk at Fort Fisher, I'm like, you can just go outside and look. And you can do that to some extent here. Although, of course, the Civil War fortifications here were already in existence. Right? But one of the questions we have to think about when we look at these fortifications is who built them? Right? Lots of different people participated in building the wartime fortifications, uh, but these big installations, not, not the field fortifications, but the big long-term installations, in many cases were built by enslaved men, right, who were brought into work for the engineer department. Um, so sometimes the state engineer corps and then the Confederate engineer department and in some configuration thereof. Uh, Soldiers absolutely were also put to work digging the fortifications. We know this because they complained about it all the time. They said, I didn't sign up to be a soldier to work like a slave, right? That digging ditches is not work for soldiers, right? So whenever possible, there were attempts to find other sources of labor and that included um, sort of voluntary calls. Initially, everyone's like, well, the slaveholders will just send their slaves to help us out. And some people did, right? Early in the war, spring of 1861, a couple of people were like, sure, take my workforce for a couple of weeks, no problem. I believe in the cause, right? I'm sending my son, I may as well send the slaves too. Um, that didn't last very long. Most people got over that altruism pretty quickly. Um, there were attempts by local governments to have labor levies. And this was a fairly common pre-war practice that you'd need to build a bridge or fix a road in your community. You have a labor levy and the county slaveholders are supposed to send people for a couple of days. Right? Now they're talking about a couple of weeks, a couple of months, longer distances, and that doesn't go as well. There's a couple of attempts to use prisoners, uh, but there aren't that many people in prison. So that, that source doesn't go very far. So the turn to slave impressment was really in part because all of the, the voluntary options dried up pretty quickly. Right? And, sorry, I'm just trying, I don't wanna get ahead of myself. Um, very early in 1862, there are conversations at the state level in Virginia, in North Carolina, in a number of states, Tennessee in particular as well, about do we want to create some sort of law that includes enslaved people as property that can be taken for military purposes? Um, and we start to see those laws being put into place in 1862 and then in 1863. Next slide, please. So there's a big call for labor in the fall of 1862 in Virginia, when the first laws are put into place, and then shortly thereafter in North Carolina as well. Um, and I always like to talk with people about the process of what these enslaved men experienced, right? So Virginia had a very specific set of rules about how this was going to work. And so it was a two-month term. So you're called up and a quarter of the able-bodied enslaved men from your county are expected to come and your county officials are expected to make sure that that happens. Right? And so they get to, they, they, each county kind of does its own thing, but often they're just like, who do we have? Let's make a list and then a quarter of those people will go. Um, and the county is responsible for getting those slaves to wherever they're called for and then coming back in two months and gathering them up and also gathering the pay that will go to the slaveholders. So it's intended to be a two month experience. Uh, during those two months, for the most part, these enslaved men are doing heavy manual labor all day. Um, the, the, the 1846 treatise on fortification that was taught at West Point to the engineer corps uh, talked about a three-man team who was going to dig the ditches, right? And they had to dig six feet down, right? 
and then pitch the dirt to the top of the mound they were creating, which of course is quite high by the end of that. So two, one guy has a pickaxe and the other two have shovels. So you can imagine this is sort of heavy work on the shoulders and the upper back and the upper arms. And the recommended amount of soil they would move per day weighed about two tons. So imagine doing that for 60 days straight on the standard army ration of about a pound of grain and a half pound of pork and sleeping on the ground in a tent in between. Right? You can imagine that this is really difficult labor. And in fact, there's an attempt, the engineer, the head of the engineer department in Richmond asks the secretary of war to increase the ration. He said, these men actually need more food, right? The, 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 the level of work they're doing is more than what the soldiers are doing. They need more food. And Seddon, this is um, James Seddon at the time was the secretary of war. He, I'm paraphrasing, he said, like, you're right, but I can't feed the slaves more than I feed the soldiers. That's just not good optics. He didn't say that, but that's sort of in a, in a modern parlance, right? That how we would imagine that doesn't really work politically, even if it's true, it doesn't work. So, and then we think about places like Wilmington where these men are kept beyond the initial 60 days. They're brought in in November. They're here in December. They're here in January. They're here in February. Has anyone been to Fort Fisher in January when they do the annual? Sometimes it's lovely and sometimes it's absolutely miserable, right? And that would also be the case for these men who, um, particularly late in the war when there's significant Union gunboat activity, also are encamped nearby, not allowed to have fires because that becomes a target. So they're there in the winter, sleeping on the ground, doing this work all day. Uh, so there's a lot of medical records about what happened to these people. The engineer department in Richmond actually builds its own hospital to keep track of the laborers in the Richmond fortifications. But then the um, other areas where this is happening, um, you know, I've said Wilmington a couple of times, obviously Goldsboro, other places, anywhere there's a railroad junction or depot, there's a fortification happening. Um, another key area, if you go further west into town and sort of what's now Greensboro, there's a lot of railroads that combine into Virginia, places like Lynchburg, rail lines, major hospital, Saltville. Protecting the salt mines is really crucial as well. So any place where there's significant fortification, there are these, you know, hundreds often at a time of enslaved men who are brought in. The, the first call in Virginia in a, October 1862 is for 4,000 slaves. November 1862, there's a follow-up for another 5,000 slaves from counties that weren't included in the first call. Um, so there's hundreds and thousands of enslaved men being called and pulled out of the fields. And they're not doing that much farm work by late November. So it's kind of, they can be spared at that particular moment in time. And that becomes one of the challenges, right? Um, the conflicts politically is when is the best time to pull a quarter of your able-bodied men off the farm, right? It's typically in the dead of winter right? or actually in the middle of the summer. Right? You don't want to put people, pull people out of the fields during planting or during harvest. But traditionally, once the crop was in the ground, a lot of the day-to-day -day maintenance is done by enslaved women. And so sure, take the men. So there are these moments where impressment works and there's not much conflict over it. And then there are other moments where things uh, become a huge conflict. And in North Carolina, can we go to the next slide, please? In North Carolina, there is more conflict in most cases than in Virginia. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, the North Carolina legislature passes an impressment law in December 1862. And this is as Roanoke has recently fallen or been liberated, depending on your perspective, right? Um, to, to Burnside's men earlier in the year, there's 
more and more activity along the North Carolina coast. There's also reports of yellow fever in Wilmington. So if you are being told we're taking your slaves and we're taking them to Wilmington and then we're bringing them back in a couple months, maybe sending them to a place with an active epidemic didn't seem like such a good idea. Uh, but there's this fear, right? That, that Roanoke is not the end, right? That the rest of the North Carolina coast is also potentially vulnerable. And so there's a lot of sense in the, in the, in the papers, uh, the North Carolina standard, William Holden in Raleigh is saying, General Whiting is in command at Wilmington and he has a plan. Right? And Whiting is a celebrated engineer. He does in fact have a plan. That plan involves getting a lot of laborers. And that turns out to not be quite so politically popular. But initially, Whiting is in charge. Whiting has a plan. Give him what he needs. And the legislature sort of falls in line and says, OK, what do people need? They need, they need supplies. They need labor. Right? And how do we get that? And how do we gather it and give it to the, to the front, give it to the, the people who, um, the, you know, the, the military leaders? So all of that context is driving North Carolina's decision to pass an impressment law to make it easier for the army to access supplies. Okay. Um, what's interesting is that is the way the North Carolina law was written made it confusing right, to enforce. So the, 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 my comparison was North Carolina, Virginia. So in Virginia, we get a law that says, if the engineers in the field need labor, they send a request through the chain of command to the head of the engineer department. And the head of the engineer department asks the governor of Virginia, and the governor of Virginia issues an impressment call, and each county is provided with a quota. Right? And then the county must meet that quota. So there's a very strict, like, up the chain of command, very regulated. All of these guys like work on the same street in Richmond, so that helps. It's a little easier to communicate. Um, and once they have a plan, like they, they know how many slaves are in each county and they can just kind of use the same quota system over and over again. But it has to flow through those rules. Officers can't just run around the countryside demanding slaves. They can demand other stuff, right? But slaves have to go through a process. In North Carolina, the law authorizes the governor to grant the request of Confederate officials when they want to impress slave labor, right? which is interesting. It doesn't require that the governor comply. It says the governor is allowed to comply. It's not required to. It also doesn't actually require there's, there's nothing in state law that prohibits General Whiting from just sending officers roaming the countryside to take laborers. Right? Uh, state law has this like, please ask us and we will then decide if we're going to say yes or no. And but, but there's not like if he chooses to ignore the state law, there's not a clear sense of what could happen. Right. Um, the Confederate government in uh, the Confederate Congress in the summer of 1863, maybe it's May 1863, passes its own impressment law that talks about slaves, but says if there's a state law and a state process in place, keep that. Right? The, the Confederate law only applies to places like South Carolina that didn't have a state law yet. But again, North Carolina's law is kind of vague in how it's going to work. And so there are, are very official requests that come from Whiting to the governor. And then the governor sends, in this case, um, the state militia to go and collect the slaves. Right? Whereas in Virginia, it's done by the county courts. So in Virginia, it's done by people you voted for. And in North Carolina, it's done by your militia. Right? So I think that's part of why there are more complaints from North Carolina, right? Is these aren't your neighbors and your own elected officials taking your property, it's the state militia. Um, but also there's nothing that prevents another group of Confederate officers just following their wake and taking additional laborers in North Carolina. So there's all these confused, conflicting things. And then the two month 
idea never gets honored. And Whiting just keeps people for six, seven, eight months, as long as he wants, until he gets forced to send them home. Another key part of North Carolina's law that's, that becomes important is that North Carolina allowed localities to swap out their quota. So if the quota was for slaves and they didn't want to send their slaves, but they had a free black population or what were defined as free people of color in the 1835 constitution. So free black people, but also American Indians. If your county had a decent sized population of free people of color, you could just send them. And now you've found a population that can't vote, right? that legally can't own guns, although a lot of them do, right? uh, that has less of a voice to complain than the slaveholders. Right? And so what we'll see is counties that have large populations of free people of color just sending them over and over again instead of the slaves, right? because no one is going to speak up for the free people of color, you know, it was the slaveholders are speaking up for their own interests by trying to keep their slaves at home. So things are, are a little disorganized in North Carolina by comparison. And it's also important when we think about the, the geography of slavery in North Carolina, right? Okay, so we have large enslaved populations in the far Northeastern part of the state, and those are in easy reach of the fortifications in southeastern Virginia. So you'll hear slaveholders from counties like Bertie up here complaining that it's the, the Virginia Confederate officials who are constantly coming in away and taking their slaves. So they're kind of supplementing their needs out of the North Carolina population. And then it's the southeastern part of the state that's left to kind of serve the needs of Wilmington. And then if you live farther out in the West, because the, the, the calls and the requests were based on the 1860 slave population, often the Western part of the state is completely left out of this. Right? And what's interesting is that the enslaved population of the Western part of the state actually increases over the course of the war, because people who are fleeing the Eastern seaboard and these places that are becoming occupied, if they, they take slaves with them, and they go out to the western part of the state. And yet the western part of the state is often just sort of, yeah, you only have 20 slaves, you don't need to worry about this. But they in fact have several hundred by that point. It's just not reflected in the census records. Um, so so the, the, the burden of doing this really falls on one section of the state. Like one section of the state is being taxed heavily essentially to serve Confederate needs out of state. Right? And then the southeastern corner of the state is being constantly called on to send their slaves. And these men who were gathered up in November, December, 1862, early January, with the idea that they would come home, they would be sent home in two months, are still there in March and April. Next slide, please. And May, 1863. We, we start to see complaints and counter complaints, other responses, right? So the farmers are writing in, they're writing to the governor. And Zebulon Baird Vance, governor of North Carolina at the time, has this very sort of populist orientation. People see him as someone who cares about the people who will be responsive when they write him letters. So they do. They write him a lot of letters. And they are complaining that they cannot grow food. They can't get their crop in the ground because two thirds of their most active workforce has been taken away and not returned. Um, they can't plow, they can't prepare. And some of them are, you know, there, there's this very clear argument of what do the soldiers in the field need, right? And the soldiers in the field need fortifications, but they also need to eat. And if you can't get a crop in the ground, you can't feed the home front, or the army. And so this debate over and over again, so that, you know, Wilden, William Holden, strong supporter of this process, at least in 1863, um, is saying, well, the farmers are saying they must have hands to make corn, right? Certainly, but who will cultivate the farms of the thousands of soldiers in our ranks? Will these gentlemen, 
slaveholders, the gentlemen who complain, spare a hand or two to help out on the farms of the poor Confederate soldiers? We think not, right? So he's kind of calling up these class concerns that we often hear cited. Um, and if we think about the Confederate, sorry, total like brain fart there, just went away. Uh, so <laughs> we think about Confederate conscription laws that provide this exemption, right? If you have 20 or more slaves, you don't have to, you can, you get one exemption from the draft. And there's all these restrictions on it, right? You, you, it has to be used for someone who actively, like you can't give it to your son unless your son actually has worked on your farm in some capacity. There's a lot of restrictions as it turns out, but it, it plays into this sense, right? That, that the Confederate government is protecting the investments of the wealthy people and just sending the poor Confederate soldiers off to die, right? The argument for that law, the argument for returning the slaves is the big grain planters are the ones who feed the army, right? And you can't feed, you can't have the army keep going if you can't feed the army, right? So the, 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 the necessity of having food is really crucial. And what we're also seeing is, um, you know, and this, of course, spring of 1863, these are the bread riots. There is this moment where it's very clear that if you can't feed the home front, you're going to have trouble as well. Right? And people are in the streets of Richmond, but elsewhere in the South, too. And they're right. These women are writing to their husbands and saying, we're starving. Come home. So you also can't keep, you can't keep men in the army if you don't feed them. You also can't keep men in the army if they're constantly getting letters from home saying, your children are gonna die of starvation unless you desert and come back, right? So it is of paramount importance to the War Department to make sure that crops get planted and harvested, right? And so there's this constant push and pull and you know, the title of, the, the piece comes from a letter that one of these uh, farmers wrote to Vance and said, you know, I heard General Lee said, let the, let the slaves make the corn while the soldiers make the embankments, right? That we need the hands, and they said hands, not slaves, but we need the hands in the field. We need the food, right? And so in May, 1863, next slide, thank you. Um, Governor Vance says, the time has come. I don't care what you're doing at Wilmington, send all of the slaves home. General Lee did it, right? Every Virginia commander agreed in April, 1863 to send the slaves home so they could start getting the, field, the crops in the ground. Every other fortification place has these ebbs and flows in labor source. But Whiting is kind of like McClellan. He just always wants more men and he always thinks he doesn't have enough and that he's being shorted somehow. And he usually has better supplies than anyone else, but he, you can't convince him of that. Um, so Whiting very reluctantly complies with this request from the governor's office, uh, which is being backed up by the Secretary of War saying, look, we have a serious food crisis on our hands. We need the workers sent home. And you know what we'll start to see as well are things like counties being granted, there's a Confederate law in the spring, late spring, summer of 1863 in the aftermath of these bread riots that allows county governments to purchase supplies at military cost. So if the army is paying you, well, you know, well below market value for your grain, they're buying it for, they can, first of all, they can just take it, but they can also buy it from you at lower than market costs. There's all sorts of laws that set that up. Well, in the aftermath of the bread riots, the Confederate government gives county governments the same power to purchase food supplies at less than market value from the farmers to distribute to the poor. And so we often hear, you know, this is sort of a sidetrack to this particular talk, but we often hear that like the Confederate government didn't do anything in the aftermath of the bread riots. And that's not true. What they did though were give local governments 
the tools they needed to resolve the problem. So it didn't look like they did anything because it all happened locally, right? Um, so Whiting says, send the slaves home. Sorry, Vance says, send the slaves home. Next slide, please. Whiting constantly writes back to Richmond complaining about this. The Secretary of War is not sympathetic because the Secretary of War says everyone had to send their slaves back so that, that we could get crops in the ground. This is just how we're doing things, right? Um, Whiting, I don't know how familiar you are with, with Whiting's story, but it's you know locally significant, right? He had spent two years in 1856 through 58 in the area, you know, it, prior to the war as an engineer, he was one of, you know, extremely impressive record at West Point. Um, sent immediately into the engineer corps because of his strong grades, did all of this work along the Cape Fear River, married a local woman, right? and so was sent here in November 1862, right as this impressment law was being created and the first quota being issued. So I think part of it is he just like, well, this is how things are, right? I show up and they send me slaves to do the work. Didn't occur to him that that was like a one-time thing. Um, so he did in the summer send the slaves home at the governor's request. Again, men who had been sent away supposedly for 60 days are now there three, four, five, six months. And instead, he said, well, who else can I get to do the work? And he turned to free men of color in the area and sent his officers out to collect free black men and American Indian men to take the place of those impressed slaves. And this is where I often have, a, you know, we have a conversation about terminology when I'm talking about this with people who focus more on the American Indian side, right? I talk about impressment with slaves because legally this is about collecting property, right? And legally enslaved people were property. And we try to often, you know, reiterate enslaved people who had the legal status of property, right? Um, people who talk primarily about free people being forced to do this military labor often use the term conscription, which I find confusing because they're not, they're very explicitly not being treated or seen as soldiers. And we tend to think about conscription as the military draft. So I've been taking to more often just talking about enforced labor, labor quotas, things like that, uh, because impressment doesn't accurately describe gathering up people who are not legally property, but who are people, right? And for even though they're not citizens and forcing them. And so I mean, kidnapping could be an appropriate piece of terminology as well. Um, and so that's why I, I, in a lot of the talks, I kind of shifted to saying forced military labor, so that it kind of encompasses all of these things. So, but anyway, um, Whiting solved his problem by making it somebody else's problem. Uh, the, the free black and native populations of the southeastern part of North Carolina were gathered up and spent much of November, December, January 1863 into early 1864 on the fortifications and then were sent home, those who survived. You know, there's high rates of disease. There's no clear answer to the question of how many people died in this process. We don't have good records, particularly at Wilmington. There are other places in the Confederacy where we have better records um, and hospital records and a record book of all of the people who worked on fortifications throughout Richmond who got smallpox and were sent to the smallpox hospital. Um, when I found that record in, in this National Archives, it's there's one smallpox hospital in Richmond. And so it's every person, whether they are Confederate high command, Confederate private, Union prisoner of war, impressed slave working on the fortifications. They all end up in the one smallpox hospital. And there's a record book from this hospital that on the front cover has a list of all of the different sections, right? So they kind of kept the books separate for each population 
And the last notice in the last section says, Negroes working on fortifications. And then in parentheses, of no value. Right? Uh, because as far as the government was concerned, when these records were cataloged in the National Archives, the US government cataloging these records in the National Archives in the late 19th century, didn't see the stories of those impressed slaves of being of any value. Right? And of course, that was the thing I was looking for when I went to the archive. Um, it's another thing I sort of like to tell people, right? These, these are stories that have been there from the beginning that we're just finally starting to look at. Can we go to the next slide? So this becomes an issue again in the spring of 1863 spring of 1864, sorry, moving ahead. Right? Um, slaves who were gathered up in quotas in October, November, 1863, who start appearing on the fortifications in December and early January, Whiting sends home, finally, the free men he had conscripted, drafted, kidnapped into, into work. Um, the slaves are brought in. And they're brought in in, again, December, January, and they are still there in April, even though the slaveholders were told two months. Right? Now Vance has a real problem because Vance is up for re-election. Right? So this becomes a political problem for him. And he, he gets, I mean, these are two of many examples of letters he gets from people not quite saying outright, send the slaves home or we'll vote you out, but they're almost saying that, right? So we can neither get them home or get promise or satisfaction of any kind. Such treatment is well calculated to damage the patriotism of the people and destructive of confidence in the authorities, right? Meaning you, Mr. Governor, you are losing our confidence, right? And you're up for reelection little more explicit. We throughout this section are great Vance men and intend to give you a unanimous vote and hope you will do us the honor to send a dispatch sending them home as it is the season to prepare to plant our crop, right? So again, not actually saying send them home or you'll lose, but that's pretty, you can, you can read between the lines, right? Vance could certainly read between the lines. The War Department could read between the lines, and they have a problem here, because who is running against Zebulon Baird Vance? William Holden, editor of the North Carolina Standard, a year ago, huge supporter of, of slave impressment, huge supporter of whiting and whatever he needs. Now, not so much, right? And Holden is saying, you know what? This war isn't working for us. It's not successful. Let's rec if I'm elected, we're going to recall all of North Carolina's regiments. We're going to leave the war effort. Right? Seddon certainly can't afford that. Right? So there's a moment of saying, you know, like whatever imperfections there are in Vance's record of support for the Confederacy, on the whole, it's been pretty good. Right? And let's let him do whatever he needs to do to stay in that office because otherwise it's just gonna get worse, right? So in May of 1864, the Secretary of War orders Whiting to release all of his laborers and also reassigns Whiting to General Beauregard's command. And I think this is significant timing, right? Whiting had been asking for two years to be reassigned to more active duty, and everyone's like, but you are an extremely gifted engineer. We want you to man uh, to, to, to direct our most important fortifications. Why would we send you into the field where you can get shot? That's not a good use of resources. Um, but Beauregard has requested Whiting for some specific mission in and around Petersburg that he thinks, you know, Whiting's extreme intelligence will make successful. Whiting has been asking for reassignment. Whiting is also causing this huge political problem in North Carolina. So it is convenient for the War Department to reassign him at this particular moment in time. Doesn't go very well, right? Whiting is not successful in the field, almost immediately ends up back here in Wilmington 
where once again, his solution to his labor problem is to send for free people of color. They're not interested in coming back. They've done this once, they wanna stay home. And so what happens in Robeson County, right around where I work, is the Lumbee men, the American Indian men, at the time it was some, the area was called Scuffle Town or Indian Town. There's a general consensus that these people were Indians, Native Americans, even though that's not necessarily borne out by the record keeping of the time. Um, they just start hiding out in the swamps. They're gonna avoid Whiting's officers who don't know the terrain. They're gonna avoid the Confederate, the, the state militia, and they're just gonna wait it out. Did you have a question? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so they're, they start hiding out in the swamps. And I don't know if you've ever been in and around Pembroke, there's a lot of swamp. Um, it's very easy to, to hide yourself there. And then because their wives and their families are suffering because all of the men are hiding in the swamp instead of working in their crops, they start stealing food from the big planters in the area. So they're going and taking the hogs and they're taking the corn and they're, they're dropping things off at their homes in the dead of night and then going back to the swamp. And can we go to the next slide? We're starting to find more and more of the paperwork that confirms these oral histories that families handed down for generations of their men being sent to work in the fortifications. And then the aftermath being this um, in the fall of 64 and early 1865, the origins of what's called the Lowry War. Right. Um, so these are oral histories of stories like that um, Clifton Oxendine, who's one of our historians in Pembroke um, years ago, but we have a scholarship named after him in my department, um, collected right, and, and kept track of these family stories of people being forced to go to Fort Fisher right, to build the fortifications right in the fall, in the early winter, even into January, February, March. And Henry Barry Lowry kind of emerges out of this as this folk hero. He's in his early 20s. He's a fairly young man. As far as we can tell, and that we have found some receipts, we're pretty sure he was one of the group who was sent down to the fortifications in the summer and fall of 1863. So he'd done that, he'd experienced it. He was not going back in 64. And he's one of these men hiding out in the swamps, stealing the food, dropping off the food. Um, his, not necessarily for his family. He had several brothers. His father was old enough that he wasn't being caught up by the, 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 the army looking for laborers, but young and healthy enough that he still maintained his farm in pretty good repair. Um, excuse me. So Henry Barry Lowry's family itself was in pretty good shape, even with him and his brothers, mostly in the swamps. So what they're collecting often and dropping off is for other people. And so there is this sort of Robin Hood-esque character to him. And in the process of stealing a hog from one of the planters, the planter gets shot and wounded. The home guard or the local, the local um, justice of the peace and his men, along with some of the home guard, show up at the farm of Henry Barry Lowry's father and say, we know your boys are part of this. We don't know which ones. We don't know exactly who did what to where to whom, but we know your boys are part of this and we are searching your property for the things that have been stolen. They don't find them, so they take Alan Lowry, Henry Berry's father, and his younger brother, and they march them around the community, and they execute them. Henry Berry Lowry and his friends, colleagues, sometimes called gang, there's a dis another terminology dispute, do we like that term, um, respond by killing one of the justices of the peace, 
J. Brantley Harris, who was well known for his particularly brutal treatment of local Native people. This wasn't a short-term problem. Uh, he was sort of the symbol of the problems. And so this ignites a, a several year battle, first between the Lowry Band and the, the North Carolina Home Guard, then between the Lowry Band and the Klan, and then between the Lowry Band and the US government, um, who eventually have to, you know, have to put a stop there. They're in the midst of 1871, 72, in the aftermath of the Ku Klux Klan Act during Reconstruction, trying to tamp down the violence and the, the, the uh, you know, what at the time would have been seen as you know, what have the terminology irregular violence, we might now think of as domestic terrorism that is going on in Reconstruction. And even the people who theoretically are on their side, they have to get them to stop, right? So there is this long aftermath of the impressment or conscription or enforced labor of native people in Robeson County um, into the Reconstruction period, and then even in many ways the founding of UNC Pembroke, where I work, because it is after a local elected official, Hamilton McMillan, here's people talking about what happened during the war and how the Lowry's were never compensated in any way for the fact that the, the, a totally innocent old man was executed. Totally innocent. He knew what his kids were up to, but he believed they were on the side of good. Um, so it is because of that that Hamilton McMillan gets the state legislature to appropriate the $500 to create what becomes UNC Pembroke by the, you know, in our day and time. So the, 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 the um, can we go to the next slide, please? Just a couple more pictures for you. The, the impact of this story is quite long. Right? And the question of how we continue to tell this story is also an ongoing one. So if you go to Fort Fisher now, you will see in the, the main lobby. So you enter and off to the left in that main lobby, there are two cases. Right? And there's one that was done primarily by the staff at Fort Fisher and, and the state. I did a little, of, I talked with them briefly um, about slave impressment at Fort Fisher. And then there's one that was done in concert with the staff at the uh, Museum of the Southeast American Indian that's about Lumbee impressment at Fort Fisher. Right? Uh, there's a goal, of course, of building a new visitor center at Fort Fisher that will incorporate these stories more fully into how we tell things. Uh, there's an, an, a plan to build a new museum, a new Cape Fear Museum in Wilmington, and they're looking to incorporate this story more fully. So we're getting these pieces together and being more prepared to share them and tell them and expand right, the narrative of Fort Fisher, the Wilmington fortifications, and what the Civil War looked like here in North Carolina. So with that, I will take a breath and a drink of water. And, and I know we're supposed to maybe, if, if people have questions, there's going to be, oh, this microphone is what you need, yes? Um, so if people have questions, do you want the whole thing down there or? Just the, just the thing, this is easier, yes. So if people have questions, we definitely want to get you on mic. Thank make, you so much. Make sure it's hot. Yeah, let's have a round of applause, please. Uh, and the people that have to leave quietly may do so, but as I've said before, sometimes the more interesting part of the evening comes in the Q&A. We've got about 33 people watching on Zoom tonight, joining the 275 of us that were here live. So That's first impressive. question, hand raise, right here in the front row. <laughs> How many slaves did it take to build Fort Fisher over the number of years that it was being built? Again, we don't have a good record system, so I would not, hazard too much of a guess beyond the fact that at any given time there were 300 to a thousand laborers there doing the work but how many exactly because some of those people would have come in waves at different points in time but i've like i have places where i know exactly how many slaves were sent from which county to which fortification in virginia wilmington i have none of that it's just sort of guesswork and we have little bits and pieces everywhere <laughs> 
So sorry, I can't really answer that question. <laughs> I just have a question about um, the, let me see, the non-Black people that were, in, what are we calling them, in, impressed or whatever, mm -hmm. The state militias just came in and just rounded them up yep. and, and they just went off peaceably? Well, no. In fact, there's a lot of stories of resistance. I mean, the full-fledged resistance like the Lowry War. But even with this, the with with every aspect of this, there's a lot of resistance and people are, when the militia's showing up, slaveholders are fighting back. They're telling the slaves, go run into the woods. They can't take you. Uh, there's a directive that comes out from the adjutant general of the state militia that says, take overwhelming force so that no one will be compelled to resist. And if in the progress of doing your duty, somebody is unfortunately killed, that's not your fault. So there was a lot of resistance and they expected the resistance. So were these people like heavily guarded the whole time they were there? And I mean, were there a lot of, um, well, let me see, they weren't, um, uh, whatever the word, you know, brain fart. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, when you desert, they weren't desertion, but I mean, did they have a lot of problem with that? So they usually were under guard, right? So part of the deal, particularly with the slaves, but they kept kind of a similar process for the people, for the free people involved. There was always a guard of some sort keeping track of them. So they couldn't, get very far if they tried to run away. And there's actually claims boards. So if you're a slaveholder and your slave died or ran away on the Confederacy's watch, you can request the value, but you have to prove negligence. And usually they were so well guarded, there's not a lot of examples of, of successful runaways. And the people who did run away usually went home. They didn't leave entirely. But there are there are stories of runaways, right? There's there's um, particularly in the, the Virginia Peninsula, there's a, a number of records where the, where the Union officers are saying these slaves appeared. They said they've been building the fortifications. They can tell us exactly what the Confederate lines look like. So there are people who managed to run away, but they figure out pretty quickly that they need to have armed guards keeping track of this population at all times. There's also things like... Um, we're going to keep the free and unfree people separate because we don't want the slaves to learn that there are free black people because that might get give them ideas like they didn't already know that they wanted to be free. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of guardrails kind of put in place to try to make this work. There's a lot of energy expended to try to make it work. As I'm looking for the next question, um, Jamie, were there any other fortifications that used the slave or kidnapped people like Fort Caswell or Fort Anderson? So there's some reports in the Petersburg fortifications of people from the Pamunkey Nation complaining that members of their nation have been taken to the fortifications. And that's early in the war. So it's actually like a state level dispute with the Virginia Engineer Department. So I think anywhere there's extensive fortifications, slave labor is being used to build them, right? Whether it's through impressment or voluntary donations or hiring and then any place where slave labor is being used probably there are points in time where free people of color are being gathered up and forced to do the work we just don't always have a great record of it yes yeah. how well were, was a proprietor paid by the government when his slaves were taken um so the, typically, again, in Virginia, very sort of strict pattern of $30 a month for two months. So they pay quite a bit more for a slave than they do for a private. In North Carolina, they don't always get paid. Like there's a lot of disputes over pay. There's disputes over receipts. The, the free people who are told they're going to be paid often don't get paid. Uh, every so often, there's like a local lawyer who'll try to go and collect the money on behalf of, of the free people of color who hadn't been paid, even though they were promised to. I've heard that uh, the Governor Vance originally was opposed to secession. So I'm wondering how his relationship developed with the Confederate leaders during the Civil War. So Vance is definitely one of those people who was slow to, to, to be in favor of secession, right? Um, he 
I think yeah, we, there's a huge swath of people like Vance, who we think of as conditional unionists, who early in the secession crisis were like, I'm not sure this is such a good idea. I think we'd be better off staying and fighting for what we believe is important rather than like risking things getting worse. Um, over the course of the spring of 1861, most of those people get on board. It's just sort of there are various things like everyone has their kind of red line of like when once Lincoln does this, I change my mind and it's different for everyone and I don't know exactly what it was for Vance. Uh, but by May of 18, by May 20th, I guess, 1861, when North Carolina votes in favor of secession, we have a pretty clear consensus across the state. This is probably the way to go. There are pockets of people who disagree with that, right? Um, I think what's interesting about Vance is that Vance was elected, I guess, in the summer of 62, initially, fall of 62. There's a wave in 1862 of Whigs getting elected in North Carolina. And if you're familiar with the Whig party, but these are the people who are, are very much in favor of active government, um, particularly government to um, develop the economy, right? but other sort of governing practices. So Vance comes into power with a whole group of people who are in favor of more active government powers. And so I think that you know, sort of affects his relationship with the Confederacy is like he tends to be in favor of most of the policies. One of the things like a great example of this is the moment his reelection was confirmed in 1864, Vance ordered a new quota of slaves to be impressed. Like he was 100% in favor of this policy, just not right now. Like, but once his election is, in, is clear, he goes back to supporting the Confederacy in, in much more active terms. So I think he is a realist and also, of course, protecting himself um, in, in how he interacts with the Confederacy. Like he, he's a politician, yeah. Questions, we got time for two more. Hold on, I got a race to the back of the auditorium. For those of you that can't see me on Zoom, I'm going about 50 miles an hour. <laughs> All right, 45. You mentioned that the Lumbees were targeted for impressment. Was there any attempt to impress the Cherokees in Western North Carolina or is the distance just put it out of the question? So you know, there's a very, there's famously some Cherokee in the Western part of the state who enlist in the Confederate army, right, as a group. Um, and so I think because of that, the, the Cherokee were maybe a little more protected, but not much. I think it really varies. The, the, the Cherokee are, well, so there's eight tribes in North Carolina, state recognized at this point. Most of them were not particularly politically organized at the time of the Civil War. So there are places where um, Native people are going to the next county and enlisting because there nobody knows that they're an Indian, right? Um, there are places where Native people are getting conscripted for labor, right? And, and I don't know that it's one particular tribe over another. I would hesitate to make that claim. I think it maybe has a lot more to do with geography and who is more visibly and noticeably and, and easily identified because of their history as much as anything else as being a Native person who can be kind of easily grabbed. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the Lumbee people don't like just live within North Carolina. There's a bunch of them in South Carolina too. And in Marlboro County, South Carolina, South Carolina is like, eh, you're white enough, come join the army, right? So it really varied a lot. Depend and there's a lot of stories of people like, again, if you go to the next place and they don't know you, you can pass and you can enlist rather than being a laborer. And so many people, that was a better choice. We've got time for about one more question. Going once. I hope that wasn't a horrible answer. <laughs> Going. That answer might get me in trouble with someone at school. I don't know. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. Twice the seven and a round of applause for Jamie. Please. Thank you. Thank you all so much.